Joy. Next up, we have Heidi Waterhouse. Um, she lives in Minnesota with her wife, her two kids, and three cats. Um, so she worked as a technical writer for over 20 years before falling into a developer advocacy role, which she describes as all the best parts of her previous job. So Heidi is a low-key disability advocate, um, and today she's going to talk about neurodivergence, and in particular ADD, for which she received a diagnosis as an adult. So please welcome to the stage, Heidi. Hi, I'm Heidi. I'm here to talk to you about neurodivergence and how it can work out on your team. And I'm really excited to be here. You're going to have some questions, and I'm not going to answer them during the time that I have allotted, but I promise you're going to be able to find me afterwards for some reason or another. I'm not the only pink haired person, but it does narrow it down. <laughs> so, I have ADD, and so can Ushiny. I can't tell you when I first realized that not everyone could read for hours and hours and hours. But I can tell you the first time I realized that not everybody thinks that the way I do, and that the way I thought was wrong. I was in second grade, and I was sitting across the kitchen table from my mother trying to do a math paper, like those worksheets that they give little kids. And uh, every time she caught me staring off into space or being distracted, she would take a chocolate chip away from the pile that was in between us. And I knew then that something about how I was working was wrong, and something was wrong with me. And I thought that maybe if I just tried harder, I'd be able to be a good student, and I'd be able to focus and pay attention. And there were a lot of jokes. Like, we, if you went to university, there's a lot of things that we joke about writing papers at the last minute and only doing things on deadline. And we certainly perpetuate that in technology writing. So when I think about it, it just seemed normal that I could only ever do things if it was urgent and an existential threat. <laughs> OK, I want to say this right up front. Your prob Ooh, hey, stop that. <laughs> we're, we're just going to, yeah. I have a lot of slides. And now you're going to see them all backwards very fast. <laughs> So the thing is, you're not a doctor, and I'm not a doctor. And only a doctor can diagnose uh, some kinds of things like ADD, ADHD, uh, autism spectrum. Basically, all of these mental divergences we have, you can't say, oh, you're so OCD. And you can't really say, oh, I'm so OCD unless a doctor has like, done a whole bunch of study and research with you and confirmed that, yeah, you are. But you can say, I have these traits that make working this way difficult. So your diagnosis is a side issue. It makes it easier in some ways to get accommodation and medication. But on the whole, it doesn't matter if you have a diagnosis. It matters that people treat you like a human. And it matters that we treat each other like humans. So I'm neurodivergent. I have ADD. I don't identify as having ADHD because I don't have the variant that causes hyperactivity. There's a bunch of different variants and subtypes and uh, different expressions. And the way that ADD expresses in women or people socialized as women is very different than the way that it frequently expresses in people socialized as men. It's all very complicated. Um, but the thing that happens is a lot of people, when they hit the age where their kids are having trouble in school, start filling out these forms. And you're not meant to read this. It's terrible. Um, I made it tiny on purpose. Uh, they start filling out these forms, and, you, and you're filling this out for your kid, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this seems really familiar. This seems like my entire life. <laughs> this, is, this is not my kid. I mean, it may be my kid, but it's definitely me. And you go to a doctor and you say, hey, doctor, I was filling this out for the kid. And the doctor's like, oh, yes. By the way, ADD is super heritable. Um, so you take the test. And your doctor says, well, yes. Yes, you do have ADD. And then you have to have this reckoning with your entire childhood and your adult life and the fact that you got fired, like me, from three jobs for essentially not living up to potential, 
for being a person who can only work on deadline, for being someone who gets distracted and can't handle details. And it makes you really angry. It's okay to be angry. Having an adult diagnosis of neurodivergence is a really emotional moment because you realize that all the things that you've been blaming yourself for all these years are in fact the way that you're made. You can work around it. You can make mitigations, you can make accommodations, you can not take jobs that are like obviously a bad fit for you, but you're gonna be angry because you never knew that it wasn't your fault. So how many of you have ever gotten comments like this? Winston Churchill's report card. And it basically says that um, things like not working up to potential or needs to work harder or messy, untidy, terrible penmanship, right? Loses their work, like finishes their homework and then loses it in their pit of a backpack that is just like a mulch pile for homework. Uh, does terribly on homework, does great on tests. Makes bad choices even though they know better. Uh, talks too much at the wrong time, says things out, lurks things out, uh, cannot shut up in meetings. I was fascinated to learn that once I medicated my ADD, I'm capable of shutting up in a meeting and just letting people be wrong. Um, <laughs> right? Like, that's a life skill. <laughs> a lot of us got those comments on report cards and in our early jobs, and hopefully we found a job where it doesn't matter as much and we're working out okay but not always. The getting fired or ruining relationships because you cannot be on time and you cannot remember a date, or ruining friendships because you're emotionally unavailable for some reason, that's what makes this a disorder. We all have different brains. They all work different ways. That's fine. But when there's a mismatch between how our brains work and how society expects us to work, that's when there's a disorder, that friction point, that understanding that you can't do the things that society expects you without immense effort, right? I don't mesh well with social expectations around work that involve um, tidiness or completing things to a checklist or uh, mm, filling out time cards. <laughs> like, I think everyone hates filling out time cards, but I literally would not get paid because I couldn't bring myself to fill out a time card. And then I couldn't talk to the bill collectors who would like their money because I had anxiety because I knew it was my fault that I hadn't gotten paid. It was, it was bad. It was really bad. It was very hard. So as you might guess, I have long-term feelings about my ability to be a competent worker, to be an adult. We joke about adulting. Adulting is hard work. It involves a lot of like following up on details and making phone calls. And I have a lot of anxiety about the fact that I'm a bad adult. So this is where my disorder comes in. I'm a poor mesh with these parts of my life, with these parts of society. And a lot of people have the same problems or have similar problems for different reasons. It doesn't matter. You get these labels applied to you and they sink into your heart. And you really believe that you're lazy and you really believe that your distractibility is a personal failing. And that makes it hard to work with you because the whole time that somebody is trying to have a conversation about code pairing, you're actually thinking about what an awful person you are. It also plays into imposter syndrome. And um, I've given imposter syndrome talks. I'm done giving them. If you don't know what it is, um, you can now look it up on the internet. But I will say that this feeling like it is harder for you to do something than for everybody else might be real. It might not be that everybody else is floating along and you're the one paddling hard, or they might be paddling hard and looking calm on the top. Either way, we don't know how much effort people are putting into looking typical. One of the things that made me cry when I was researching this was finding out that people with ADD have a lot of difficulty starting projects. Because we look at them and we can see the whole spectrum of everything that's gonna go on, and it's too intimidating and we can't break it down. So we get all this anxiety about starting things, even small things like, oh, I want to build 
a deck, right? A person who's neurotypical may go online and find deck building instructions and order the pieces and build the deck. A person who has ADD, which leads to a lot of systems thinking, may understand that there's a lot more to it than that. And they're like, well, first I need to research what kind of footings I'm gonna put in. And I'm gonna look at like the climate predictions for the next 10 years to figure out how much. And like, because we understand that there's a lot of depth to every question, we just get stalled and can't accomplish anything. And then once again, feel like failures. ADD also comes frequently, but not always, with something called rejection-sensitive dysphoria. Have you ever had somebody who was pairing with you burst into tears? Go ahead and raise your hands. Like, crying? Yeah, that happens. People with ADD, frequently but not always, have something called rejection-sensitive dysphoria, which means that they can't, actually, I'm gonna ask a question. Is that 10 minutes to the 30 minutes? or 10 minutes to 20 minutes? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was off on my timing. Um, it means that, that we are really bad at accepting very neutral criticism, and we take it very personally. And that combines with that stuff that we got in childhood about being bad kids, so that a person with rejection-sensitive dysphoria is gonna take everything super hard. And it's very hard to work around that in a professional setting. If you're a parent right now, or a very hip manager, you know what I'm going to say. There's two mindsets that we can teach people as they're learning things. One of them is a fixed mindset. That's where we say things like, you're very smart. That is who you are. If you compliment somebody on who they are, it's a very brittle thing, because as soon as they stop being able to do that thing, their whole concept of self is broken. In a fixed mindset educational setting, it's very hard to do anything but be perfect. And when you stop being perfect, you don't know who you are anymore. In a growth mindset, we compliment people on the work that they're doing and on the things that they are trying and on their persistence in solving problems. And it gives us much more room to be able to say, like, yeah, you didn't succeed at that, but I still believe in you as a valid person. Like, you're still a good person you're just not doing that thing quite right, let me help you. Disorder isn't a binary. Neurodivergence isn't fixed, just like mindset. Sometimes we can fit other people's expectations better. Like we can take medication, we can have a bunch of workarounds. Uh, sometimes we exceed our coping threshold and we can't perform like we usually do. Like if we're having a bad time at home, we can't do good isolations between that and other things. It's easy to think of ourselves as being in the binary state of broken when we have a diagnosis. To think of ourselves as less than, or flawed, or subnormal, because we have this diagnosis, and that's very inaccurate. For this society, performing this task, we're not a good fit. But all neurodivergences have a flip side. All of them have a good side. So for instance, if you think about PTSD, you get, um, extreme startle responses and alertness. You get poor sleep and anxiety. Well, okay, those are kind of shitty for modern life because lots of things startle us and uh, we need sleep to function. But if you think about somebody who's living in a war zone, light sleep and high alertness are survival skills. People who sleep like the dead, they stay dead, <laughs> right? So when we're thinking about neurodivergence, I need us to remember that it's a disorder in this society at this time, but it's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. So when you have somebody on a team that has a special set of needs, how do you balance it? Well, either we hire people who are all like us, and we all sort of react to things the same way, or we have one outlier who is holding the boat out like this by saying, like, I'm the systems thinker and I'm gonna pull things this direction. What we really want in a team is to have people all around the spectrum of mental reactions so that we can get a full and clear picture. Because some of us are bad at things and some of us are good at things 
and they're not all the same things. So we want to fill in each other's gaps when we're building a team. But in technology, it's super easy to hire people who look like you, not just physically, but who have the same kind of education and the same kind of background. It's easy to say, what does someone who was a park ranger know about Ruby, right? But the answer is, someone who's a park ranger may have a lot more experience uh, dealing with humans and how they work with Ruby. Or someone might have more experience in how other things affect an ecosystem, right? That's a different perspective. So when we're building a team, we need to make really sure that we're not building a monolithic similar team. Neurodivergence is never, ever, a valid excuse for being an asshole. It's not okay. Like, I know that sometimes it takes me more effort to be polite than it might take other people. They're still people. And it is not okay to be a jerk just because it's work. I'm gonna say something that sounds like the opposite of this later on, but I want you to know. People who tell you that they can't be polite are mostly using an excuse to avoid the work of politeness. People, especially men, who make it a habit of transgressing boundaries are predatory jerks whether or not they have a diagnosis. Don't let people use diagnosis as an excuse for being assholes. I don't care how brilliant they are. So on a team, how can we all meet our needs? What can we do about the fact that we all have different needs? This is an amazing book. I first read the Five Love Languages book, which is about relationships in like an intimate sense. But they made one for the workplace. It's called The Five Languages of Workplace Appreciation. And it talks about how it is that you feel appreciated in the workplace. Because it turns out we're not all rewarded by the same thing. Like, I have a coworker who finds it super rewarding to get a bottle of wine when he finishes a big push. Like, we, we give each other gifts on the team. We, we have one of those systems where you can give each other gifts. He loves wine. He cares about wine. I could care less about wine. I would rather drink the grape juice. I wouldn't find it rewarding to get wine, but I love little plushies. So, like, our manager does these things. Like, some people love it when their name goes out in the newsletter and everybody understands what's going on, but other people do not find that rewarding at all. So remember, this comes from dog training, that a reward is only effective. <laughs> I have a whole talk coming on dog training. It's going to be great, because we're all mammals, and we all respond to rewards. So remember that a reward is only effective if the receiver of the award finds it rewarding. Makes sense, right? But we don't think about that. We're like, oh, this is what I'd want. That's what I'll give. It's possible that in our hunt for balance, we can tip over into diagnosing people or boxing them in. You don't want to say, can you proofread this for me because you're so OCD about details. That's shitty behavior, don't do it. You can say, I really admire your attention to detail, could you help me with this? But identifying people by their diagnosis and slotting them in as somebody who should do that by virtue of who they are is no good. It often takes a lot of work to pass for normal if your brain is not structured that way. If you're on a team that is not compatible with you, that's not working out for you, you have three choices. You can leave. I've quit jobs when I realized that I'm not going to succeed at how this is gonna work out. When I've realized that my mental weirdness is just a terrible fit for the team. And I would rather quit than get fired. Because uh, it turns out getting fired and rejection-sensitive dysphoria, not a great combination. Or you can speak up and you can say, hey, I need this team to do these things for me. I need a little help with this. I need to not be tasked with the task list. I need to be working on something that's bigger structure. And sometimes a team can help you out with that. Or you can use social engineering. Because uh, lots of us want to stay on a team, but don't want to stay on the team the way it's working now. So there's something really simple to stripping motivations down to the bare minimum. 
Modern dog training books are firmly grounded in cognitive and behavioral psychology, and that means communicating non-verbally with people and other animals. So use these things to do some training on your team. Figure out what you want, figure out what motivates your team, set clear standards for success, and fulfill promises that you've made. That works for everybody. Nobody wants to not understand what they're supposed to be doing. We would like to know what it is you want from us. So my personal hacks for dealing with ADD, reduce access to bad behaviors. I have a Twitter lock. It doesn't do me much good, but I try. Um, it turns out that existential dread really impedes my ability to get anything done, so I have to start working before I, I live in America. It's a little stressful. Um, so contextualize your usage. Like, I don't have my work email on my phone because they're not paying for my phone. No work email, no stress. Uh, encourage flow. I use the Pomodoro method. Um, I try and make sure that nothing disrupts me during that, and I turn off all the push notifications on my phone. And I train my mammal because, like everybody else on my teams that I'm trying to train, I'm a mammal, and so I can be rewarded. I write with a bag of M&Ms by my hand, and I get M&Ms when I finish sentences. <laughs> it's, I'm rewarded by M&Ms. And reduce the cognitive load that you're working with. And uh, I use Trello and other project planning methods that are very agile because it works well with how I'm going. So I've talked a lot about how you can balance your team. How do you ask for help? Remember that you can keep secrets. You don't have to tell anybody your diagnosis. All you need to tell them is what you need to be an effective worker. Like, I get distracted by movement in front of me, so I need to not sit in a cube that's near the hallway. In fact, I need to sit in a cube that's not a cube, and it's my thing at home, and it's very quiet. <laughs> I, uh, when I was pregnant, coffee smell made nausea so much worse, but I didn't want to tell anyone I was pregnant, uh, so I just asked if we could use covered cups for everyone to avoid spills. <laughs> like, but whatever you're doing, when you make a request, make sure you've also added in a solution, because saying, I don't want just muffins in a meeting, provide someone with a problem. They're like, well, what do you want? Now I have to think about what we have besides muffins. I like muffins, muffins seem fine for me. But if you say, hey, I don't want muffins in the meeting, can we also have a fruit plate? You've presented a solution. That's a tiny example, but I think you can see how it could extrapolate out to the rest of your work life. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say no to help and you don't owe anyone extra work of, because of who you are. You don't owe anyone diversity time. You don't. If you want to volunteer it, that's great, but it's not an obligation. You don't have to appear in pictures for optics even if you're the only person who looks like you in your office. You can, but you don't owe them that. I am out of time, but I'm going to put this slide deck up online as soon as I get off the stage. And you can definitely come ask me about other things. So if this was too long and you read Twitter instead, neurodivergence is an opportunity for everyone. Push notifications are the devil. <laughs> and if you want a t-shirt, you can take a picture of this slide and uh, write us and we'll send you one. Thank you for your time. <laughs>